What up, what up? Here we are with another episode of the Who's Where podcast. I'm your host, Chase Mayfield, coming to you live from Lexington, Kentucky. We have a legend, UVA legend on the on the call today, man. That he goes by Juice formally. He holds records. I'm not sure how many records he holds, but I done seen a couple of <laughs> up close and personal. I done seen a couple up close and personal myself, man. Welcome to the podcast, Michael Simpson. What's good? What's up, man? Man, I'm thankful to be on this you know, platform with you and, and having a good conversation with my teammates, man. It, it ain't no better conversation to have. Yeah, man. Fun times for sure. Uh, you know, I'm a young, younger than you. And I remember, uh, you know, I came in, I'm over here thinking like, you know, I'm at University of Virginia and I'm like, man, I ain't never heard of University of Virginia. None of that. I'm coming from Western <laughs> Kentucky and uh, we lost to Wyoming right out the gate. And uh, I was like, yo, what, what I got in what I got myself into out here, you know what I'm saying? And then, uh, then I think that's the same season you start going off, right? Like, you mm-hmm. start going off. So, I think Mike yeah. might have saved me from transferring up out of there, to be honest, man. He might have saved me from transferring up out of University of Virginia. And he brought, yeah. he brought a whole new swag to the to like what I was seeing at least. I ain't seen UVA in a while, but when I was first watching, I was like, yo, it looked look real stiff out there. And then you came out there, you know, what I'm saying he was dead legging. And you was getting loose on people. Yeah. I was like, that's more like it, man. That's more like it. That's what that's what I came here to came here to watch and came here to play with. So uh, yeah, that was that was you know I was I was different from the company company boy, I guess you would say. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was my own individual. Hey, that's what I was used to. I was used to people that was out there trying to take it to the crib every rip. I wasn't used to no four four yards of carry, <laughs> like three yards of carry type stuff. I was used to like, hey, we try to go into the house every rip. Yeah, so, but it, but it's funny. It's funny when I, my first uh, memories of you was during camp, and it would be me and you and BA up in the in the uh, room. And you used yeah. to always talk this basketball. I got a forty years vertical. How nice you was. I'm like, duh, we playing football now. Like, I wanted to say that. You know what I mean? But always be like, yo, we ain't playing basketball right now. We trying to hear that. What you been doing this field, young boy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nah, that was a long time ago, man. I remember those days though. Solid shout out to my man BA. Um, but yeah, man, Juice, man, he's right now, he's the founder of Capital Rebirth. We're gonna get into his story football wise, but I just want him to introduce what he's doing right now before we uh head backwards and do some reminiscing. Uh talk to everybody about what you're working on. So uh I am the founder and CEO um of Capital Rebirth, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that's based in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, where I'm located at. So the capital comes from Harrisburg, um, being the capital of Pennsylvania. The rebirth comes from um, two things, the the birth of my daughter during that time and giving me a new identity, a new passion. Um, And then during that time, also Lil Wayne, uh, he had his released his first rock album, which was called The Rebirth. Uh, You know, and he was crossing over from rap, uh, you know, to that. And I was crossing over from football, you know, to what is my new identity going to be, you know, because at that time, uh, a lot of people don't know. Uh, I signed up with Cincinnati Bengals coming out. Uh, and then I felt the physical. They found I had spinal stenosis and bone spurs. So, you know, the narrowing of my spine was too close. Um, the chance of being paralyzed was too high. So, mm. you know, my career ended literally, you know, the same day I got started. Uh, I still felt like the NFL would have been my best shining moments because the game is catered, you know, to, to my style, catching mm. out the backfield speed. But that's a whole nother story. But uh, you just like other... you just like Christian McCaffrey. Absolutely. Absolutely. Before his time. Yeah. You know, but um, but no, that's a whole nother story. So so I went through a, a major deep depression, um, you know, suicide thoughts, the whole nine. Um, you know, and then when I look back at my life, I, I kind of look back when I was a teenager and had a job, it was through parks and recs, you know, our city department working with the kids. Uh when I was at UVA, I would help volunteer at some of the elementary schools down there. Um, so it was like, yo, kids is my 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 passion. You know, I'm looked at as a role model just through football lens. So um, having a daughter, it's like, how how can I create a better world now, you know, for her to be in, you know, an environment for her. So um, that's how Capital Rebirth got started. You know, her birth, rebirth me, gave me new passion, new hope. So how I started to, um, I guess, develop the plans for Capital Rebirth was uh, I started with my biggest goal, which was to obtain an old high school that sits on 26 acres that's been closed for 11 years now. Uh, I've been planning for that for seven and and hopefully within this, you know, next month, two max, we can close a deal on that. But saying that um, that facility was our Votech school. 
um, for our high school and local uh, high schools for overflow there, right? So right now, um, you know, jobs, we need construction, we need labor, we need plumbing, you know, those jobs aren't being replaced with the tech, right? But what is happening, college isn't for everybody, you know, but uh, infrastructure in America in general is down. So if we can start to develop these trades and get these kids back um, learning these skills and getting certificates for the adults as well, because, you know, we can teach a kid, you know, eight to 10 hours, but if the same opportunities aren't provided for that adult, that kid's going to go back and, you know, to that house and that's reality to them, no matter what we're telling them on the other side, you know, that's a dream, you know, because what they see is, is what they're really going to believe. But if we can get their parents involved and, you know, a lot of them, um, you know, in inner cities, they have criminal backgrounds, you know, so it's hard for them to get jobs. But construction, you know, and labor, they can go in there and they can start, you know, $80,000, you know, $100,000 jobs easily. That's the ability that they need, um, you know, and that's for that kid to be able to see. And that's where the main change will come. So that's why I started with that big project, um, you know, and also entails bringing an indoor uh, stadium that would sit 20,000. Uh, you know, I look up where we're at right now in the Northeast region there's four seasons, you know, so even in the summer, we can deal with rain. So it's not, you know, uh, any indoor facilities, you know, up north in the whole entire Northeast region to accommodate this weather. Um, you know, right now we're looking at a pandemic that stadium right now could be used to hold some of these vaccines or, you know, to some of these uh, places where they're delivering shots at, at a massive rate. The city of Harrisburg population is only 49,000. So that was my big goals, you know, to bring the, the, the school district back which is a state receivership right now, over the 500 schools um, in the state of Pennsylvania, we're ranked 497, you know, so we're the third worst school district in the, in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, financially, we struggle. So what that would do is right now, our school district is paying um, another school district $3 million for only 200 students to attend their DC tech program to learn these trades. So there's an the overflow and a lot of kids left out of this portion, right? Um, and the school is putting that bill so now if we can get the school to kind of move into this facility and be tenants, um, you know, with 75 classrooms, 25 kids per 15,000 per kid, um, 1,800 enrollment total, that's $23 million our school district benefits, you know, so that's taking care of the school district, right? Now, the city with the stadium, the, you know, uh, big events that we can host, you know, like I said, some of these promoters in bigger cities they're not going to take these gambles outside anymore. They're going to start coming here, you know, to do business and where the capital. So now you boom, you know, our city with the education funding and now the tourism, you know, through this stadium. Um, now, you know, our city has money to solve some of these other issues that we have. So those were my big two things. Uh, and then, you know, I had to understand, too, I had to actually get out in the community and do things. So that's where you see the events, um, the programs and workshops come into play to build that brand, you know, to let the community know, hey, I am going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. So when it's time for me to present this big plan, you guys know exactly who I am. You see my track record. Um, and I'll be honest, a lot of that came out of my pocket. We did over 25 events in a year and a half. You know, and a lot of that, honestly, we had a total of $2,500 donated to us total. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's literally one event. You get two, three inflatable bouncer houses for one event that's almost two grand right there. So that money, you know, was gone. So all these other events, I realized, hey, I got to invest in something too to make people believe me. And I'm, you know, not just out here trying to collect funding. So nobody on my team of eight right now has even received a penny, has made a penny. You know, we we, we kind of put the, 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 uh, the bill on us, you know, and get it done to show the community, hey, we're not here for money. We're not here for, you know, popularity reasons. We're here to, you know, engage and provide, you know, things for you guys. So our mission statement, I'll sum this up for that, is we're here to provide positive, um, family-friendly events and programs for Central Pennsylvania, which is, you know, the jurisdiction that we're in pretty much. So that's Capital Rebirth in a nutshell. Um, yeah. And our biggest thing is our superheroes. Mm -hmm. So we have Anti-Bullying anti Superhero Day. Excuse me, I forgot. I can't leave that part out. Uh, sure. Anti-bullying, yeah, anti-bullying superhero day, uh, where we have uh, people dress up as uh, their favorite superheroes. They can come out, but we also have the adult versions where we actually spend three, four hundred dollars on these suits. You know, the nice leather ones, and have you know them come out, take pictures with the kids. Like I said, we have the inflatable bouncers out there. Um, everything is free. You know, food, games, um, you name. It. We got a DJ out there. Uh, you know, kids love to dance, so we entertain them with that. 
Um, but what we also like to do is, is on the serious side of it is we understand that bullying is a big issue. Um, I worked in a psychiatric hospital where kids uh, attempt to commit suicide, you know, for various reasons, a lot of them being bullying. So I know the ser severity of it. Um, so what we try to do is have uh, resources on site at our very event. So when you come to an anti-bullying event, you know, hey, there's a hotline that I can call. Uh, okay, here's a local service provider that I can go to. Okay, here's a mental health um, provider, you know, that can get my son hooked up or my daughter hooked up with a therapist to work her through some of these issues that she's dealing with. Um, so like I said, we, we, we want to bring awareness to what we're doing, but we also want to have a mission and a goal with it. And that's to connect them, you know, with the people who are actually, you know, designed to do this work because Calvary Rebirth, we don't have all the answers. We want to be like that, that solution bridge gap, you know, helping people uh, assist them to these different directions that they can help. Um, so that was our biggest thing. And what we want to do with that as well, we actually create our own superheroes. Um, so it's two of them. It's a man and a woman. Um, and their superpowers is kind of like uh, Superman. Mm -hmm. What they do is um, when a kid is being bullied, they pop up, you know, they identify the triggers, provide some coping skills and alternate uh, routes to handle a situation. So I wrote four scenarios. It's a fourth grade and under book. Um, you know, one of them, uh, you know, a kid shows up to school for breakfast. Uh, he cuts the line, pushes the kid, you know, in the front of the line out the way. So superhero pops up, okay, figures out, hey, what's going on? Um, the kid hasn't eaten since yesterday. You know, he, he at home, he's struggling to get meals and some nights he just doesn't have them. That was one of those nights. So, you know, the, the, the superhero kind of provides these skills like, hey, maybe you can come in the morning and tell your teacher, hey, I haven't ate last night. You know, is it possible I can go to the front of the line? That solves that whole issue right there, you know, yeah. simply. So we, we break down different, you know, scenarios that these kids face on a day to day um, because I also taught for three years uh, in our local um, schools as well. So, you know, I got a different lens, you know, from seeing them at their lowest you know, to actually see them live in classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so so I think that those um, books would be great. And we want to actually develop them into like a cartoon series, um, you know, because bullying and suicide rates are, are enormously large right now, especially with the online um, social network platforms that can carry over to real life. So, you know, it's a serious issue. What are you? Um, like I said, I, I know, you know, unfortunately, a lot of kids who have actually, you know, taken their life through that, um, you know, and our other biggest identity um, for Capital Rebirth is our Stop the Violence and Drug Abuse Talent Festival. Uh, which drug abuse, you know, is, is a major issue in our community um, and gun violence, you know, it, it's big in our city. It's real. Um, you know, a lot of the teenagers, 12, 13 years old, you know, they're shooting, you know, and, and they're dying out here, you know, so we want to bring awareness to that. But what we do with that is kind of promote, you know, positivity to entertainment. So we allow, you know, local artists to come out, perform, whether it's rapping, singing, um, dancing, the local high schools come out and perform. Uh, we had gospel, um, you know, poetry, uh, uh, excuse me, gospel uh, singers out there as well. So different all types of genres, you know, just coming together and letting everybody know, hey, we may know a friend or a family, you know, that is going through this, whether they're in the streets or, you know, whether they're abusing drugs. Hey, it, it, it's OK. It, it's you don't you're not normal. You know, we're yeah. all going through this, you know. So here's some resources on site where you like I said, where you can go get some information and try to help your friend or your family. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all living in the same community. So, you know, we got to pick each other up. So, you know, if we see somebody struggling over drug issues, yeah, we we may, you know, turn our head to it. But at the end of the day, our kid is seeing that person down the street. Who knows? Our kid may, you know, get curious. Oh, well, what's, what's that? What's that kid? What's that guy on? Why is he acting like that? Oh, well, maybe one day I get older, man, but I want to try it. You know what I mean? So we just want to clean that up and get that person help. Because a lot of times it is, it comes down to mental. You know, we escape a lot of our uh, problems in reality that we're facing. And we depend on drugs and, and alcohol. Like I said, when I when I went through my situation, that was something I literally did. I was in Miami, you know, every day of the week, pretty much drinking, you know, smoking, just trying to escape the realities that, hey, football is over, Michael. It's time to move on. And yeah. that took a while, you know, and that was a hard pill to swallow. But like I said, I depended on those things, those substances. And that's a real thing. Yeah. No, that's 100 percent, man. That's a lot of information. But one thing I can tell is that this is authentic. This is like an authentic project. It's not nothing else necessary than like my kids always been in the superheroes, you know, say he always been in the Batman and stuff like that. So everything he's doing is doing things from like what he thinks can help people. And I think that's super dope, man, what yeah. you're working on uh, and all the things you're doing. So essentially, um, 
you know, while we're like we're, while we're still at the beginning of the podcast, before we get into the you know the nitty gritty, like, are you yeah. asking for something? Are you looking for something that you know maybe somebody can help that's listening to our podcast and things of that nature? Like, are you raising capital? Um, like, what are, what are some of the needs that you that you need from Capital Rebirth to to be successful in your uh, in your endeavors? Yeah. So uh, right now, um, our, our two biggest hurdles that we're trying to cross right now is figuring out who at the state level is going to make the decision on, you know, who who gets that land. Uh, like I said, our school district is in receivership. So that's kind of, you know, out of reach for anybody right now. We have 9,000, you know, signatures supporting it from our community residents, you know, along with elected officials, city councils and the mayor. Um, but we do, we are trying to raise uh, $75,000 to pay for our comprehensive plan, you know, upfront to study work. So um, that is something we have a website, um, www.capitalrebirth.org. Um, if you go to donate, um, you know, that money goes directly to that project. If you just label it, like I said, we haven't made a penny. So I don't want people to think, oh, well, $75,000 is he trying to, you know, put some money in his pocket. That's not how I operate. You know what I mean? Like this project, you know, once it's able to get the funding for that part, then we can, you know, actually go ahead and get the tenants. Like I said, right now, our broker, um, he, he is with one of the largest firms in the world right now. We have over 125 tenants kind of lined up and ready. So it's just kind of, hey, we just need this upfront money, you know, to get the ball rolling. And people, you know, understand that part of the game. They'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. But, you know, even if you just want to donate to some of these events that we have coming, uh, we have 12 events scheduled. Our first one being April 3rd, which we're going to do a drive-by Easter, um, Easter egg kind of basket giveaway because of COVID. You know, we have five playgrounds picked up throughout the community, you know, that hits every territory. We'll, you know, have the Easter Bunny come out and take pictures. Like I said, we have our superhero events coming up. So if you just want to, you know, even if it's, you know, money towards the superhero suit, you can label that. We'll make sure, you know, that money is spent wherever, you know, you're saying. And if you want, you know, the trust to go even more, we'll follow up with a receipt, you know, stating, hey, your funding wants to hear, you know, because that's the last thing I want people to do when it comes to money, because it can get tricky. You know, people can, you know, be be harsh out here and, and take the money and use it for the wrong reasons. So, you know, that's if you want to donate, uh, we have rubber bands on our website as well, um, you know, that you can purchase and we'll mail to you as well. No, that's what's up, man. So from a leadership perspective, like you, you going to attack this vision like this, you know, what even gives you the like, um, I don't know, balls, audacity, whatever you want to call it to even like write down huge plans like this. Uh, I know you'll go big guy anyway, but essentially like just from everybody listening in, like what makes you like somebody might be like, what makes him think he can do that type of things? Like what, what gives you the, the thought process and the mindset to write something big down like this to impact your city like this? So here, here's, here's the two keys. Um, so I developed to, to kind of give me that tunnel vision, as they say, uh, like an umbrella. So I used the umbrella handle as the core. So I wrote the core values of who I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the, the individual kind of shields within the umbrella, those were the goals. The raindrops under each of them was the steps that I needed. And I got very comfortable with saying no to someone if it didn't align with my goal. So that cut a lot of time and BS out, right? So that allowed me to plan. Yeah. So like I said, I planned for this project for seven years. So it wasn't something I just, you know, kind of wrote down, you know, sat on maybe a couple of weeks, couple of months. No, like I, I've got thousands and thousands of paper research done. So what the saying is, if you have passion and you have your plan well put together, and you put it out there, you'll be surprised at who wants to support and who believes in you. Mm -hmm. Like this started with just me, you know, and, you know, I got my team together, which consists yeah. of eight of us. Now we put it publicly, right? We had 9,000 signatures, the mayor calling us, city council supporting it, you know, the school board, although they don't have power right now, but they're supporting it. So people are going to come and help. You know what I mean? Like I said, we don't have no funding right now. But these architects and developers, um, you know, and finance people, they believe in it. And the first thing I'll be honest, they always say is, it's the passion in you that gets me. So, like I said, but that passion comes from and that confidence comes from make sure that you put that work in. Don't mm -hmm. just put out, you know, no half ass product. Excuse me for cussing. But, you know, don't put that out there. The people can read through BS, you know, like so if you were confident, well thought out. You can ask me any question about my project, I can answer it. 
No, that's 100 percent. You know, so when these people, okay, if I ask you a question, you can't answer it. I don't trust you that you actually put in all the work. Yeah. So, you know, I I and and also, you know, the other part it was football. You know, I was always taught, you know, go to the NFL, be the best. So I'm always going to have that mentality. You know, it's just less of a a competition where I want to see you lose. You mm-hmm. know, football was, hey, you were on my team. Like, I wasn't talking to you. Like, seriously. And that was like LaShawn McCoy, you know, yeah. who's a Hall of Famer probably. We were rivals in high school. We didn't speak at yeah. all until, until all that was done. Like, that's how, you know, football was. Like, if you weren't on my team, I have no reason to talk to you. But now it's like, I want to be that, that, you know, quarterback kind of, you know, that sets up the receiver, you know, that helps that lineman, you know, by stepping up in the pocket, which is my community, these local businesses, you know, these local nonprofits or else, you know, doing the groundwork as grassroots programs as well. Um, you know, so, so that's where it kind of comes from. Um, and at the end of the day, the worst thing that can happen is no out of any situation. Yep. That's what they can say is no. <laughs> we just back where we started. You know and you move and you move on. Same, same. No, that's what's that's good advice for everybody. All right, man. So we're gonna jump into uh a little bit of this backstory a little bit. So, you know, you're from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not familiar with it, you know. I say I've never been around there, but essentially you played at Harrisburg High School. Um, the, the myth is, you know, you had all the offers across the country, you know what I'm saying? I went, I went looking at rivals and stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but they said, they said he had all the offers around the country, you know, uh, you know, Florida's and all these different type of big players that was, you know, number one in the country winning the championships while we was at school. So I called, I was like, why are you here? Why are you here? Dude? You know what I'm saying? So, uh, talk to me about that, man. Why'd you choose to go to University of Virginia after being a big time recruit? Yeah, so uh, Alabama was actually uh, my second choice. Florida was my third. I loved everything about Alabama, but the separation was I knew that my family wasn't going to be able to come see me play, but maybe once a year. You know, we weren't, you know, financially stable. You know what I mean? As a family, where it could be like, hey, we can go down, take these flights, you know, five, six times a year. Now that's going to be one trip. You know, my family was very important to me. Um, You know, they supported me since a kid, you know, um, and, and, and I also didn't understand at that time, because I'll be honest, I didn't have nobody help me with recruiting coming out of high school, you know, even being all American, even, you know, 50 scholarships, my head coach didn't even, you know, give me any guidance, you know what I mean? So if I'd have known that, hey, you want to come home for two weeks, probably, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that would influence me, you know, a little more too. Yeah, you know, because it's like, hey, you know, it is what it is at this point. Hey, and then, you know, somebody really talked to me like, hey. In four years, if you do good, you're going to the NFL. That's a whole nother city. So you, you need to get used to moving away from your family and that comfort. But I didn't have nobody, you know what I mean? But it, it is what it was. Um, and also just UVA's, the education. So I always knew that UVA was, you know, number one, number two, number three, you know, top public school uh, in the country every year, you know, depending on what you look at. Mm-hmm. So I always knew in the back of my head, Football is going to end someday. So I need something on paper, you know, that's kind of respectful. So that was kind of the reason I ended up at UVA. The biggest one was Coach Dex. I keep it 100%. Everybody Coach says Dex. That. Oh, my. Listen, Coach Dex was the most down to earth coach. Um, and then, honestly, when you look at when Coach Dex switched side of the ball, so did my career. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, that's interesting. So, you know, you're like yeah. the fourth, fifth person that doesn't say Coach Dex that we don't have on here. And, you know, yeah. he, he, that's crazy how they let Coach Dex get up out of there if he bringing in all the all the players. Man, you know? listen, but he was a great coach. So, like, like, like what I loved about Coach Dex as a coach, you know, some coaches demean you, you know, they're cushy wild, you know, feel like they just, you know, they so much above you. Yeah. Coach Dex, he would cuss you out, but it would be in the most joking way, you know, like, like. <laughs> It's coming off like one of your homies talking stuff to you. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I get your message. I understand what you, but I'm also not taking it personal. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're not being disrespectful. But some coaches, you know, like that that, that, that loud cussing and all that, like you turn me off completely because oh, I'm, yeah. a grown, I'm a grown man. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and if worse come to worst, if we get physical, I know who's going to win this bout. Yeah. You know what I mean? So let's stop talking just because you're in that position. 
Yeah. Like, like just treat me as a man. Hey, if I messed up on a play, let me know. Yeah. Cool. We can move on. Yeah. No, I feel that, man. A lot of coaches get real. We're going to see some crazy stuff out there. I ain't going to put nothing out there. But uh, <laughs> so, man, you show up to the University of Virginia and you actually red shirt. That's what I'm looking at right now. You red shirt in your first year after having 50, 50 offers in uh, Alabama and Florida and yeah. everything else. What was up with that? Yes. So we was we was we was solidified. We had a uh, Wally Lundy there. Wally was there. there. Yep. So so honestly, that was that was my thought process. I didn't want to play my freshman year. I said, hey, that's a vet. You know, I can sit back and learn. You know how how he approaches the game, and I knew I was a little thin. You know, because let's I'm gonna keep it real. In high school. Yo, our weight room was rubber bands. We didn't have no, we had no weights. No weights. We had no weights, dog. So you know, I knew I was behind the eight ball. So I'm like, let me, you know, sit back, develop. Okay, cool. Learn from Wally. So you know, I, I didn't really want to play my freshman year. If they wanted to put me out there, I don't think I would have been ready. Um, yeah. So then, you know, I actually spring, I, I took it serious, and I got a uh, offensive, uh, what was it, improvement, Ricky, whatever improvement, offensive spring, whatever it was. Yeah. But I won that award. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, hey, now, you know, it's, it's about to be go time. Okay, I'm a red shirt freshman. I, I, I got this now. So then we make a move and we move our fullback, Jay Snell, back to tailback, mm. you know, at 240. So I'm like, why? Why? I'm here. Like, let him play his role, you know, yeah. as that fullback who can catch, you know, let him play his his normal game. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and true story. So we're playing Duke. Um, who I ended up scoring my first touchdown against that year. Uh, before the game, Coach Deck comes up to me and he's like, yo, we got a thousand yard back, just sits on the sideline every Saturday. You know, like like they seen it, you know, but and, and another thing I think what hurt me is I wasn't a rah-rah guy in the, in the weight room or in the workouts. Yeah. You know, but but that didn't mean I wasn't getting stuff done. You know what I mean? So like I was my body fat was always where it needed to be. My weight was always needed. If you look, go back and look at any time we had max out days, I was always maxing out. So, yeah, I, it didn't look like it because I just – and even if you look at my football tape, it looked like I glided through things. It looked effortless. That's just who I am. So, as a coach, you should be able to see that in the player of all these coach, all these players that you have coached. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so they, 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 they kind of use that against me to, you know, to not play me in the games. As, you know, he's not a rah-rah in the weight room. And, you know, we, we had the conditioning test, the 300. Well, who was always in first place and second place until Jared came, Jared Green? Yeah, I always seen Jared because he's in my class. Yeah, but it was me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it was. So you can't say, "Oh, well, my career didn't work out." Okay, now the first time I really got in the game against Maryland, right? I had all those touches, fifteen in a row. Did you ever see me tap out? Did you ever see me get tired? So obviously, I was doing something to keep my body in shape. You just couldn't. I don't know. Grasp yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. That's I always thought that because you know it just didn't make no sense. And I'm over here reading on this on this site. They said you got moved to wide receiver for a little bit. That was the the year from the Wyoming right before we played Wyoming. Oh dang, I didn't even realize that. So, yep, so like what, I said, so, whose decision was that? So it was after doing uh, the spring. So like I said, I got improvement. And then we went, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm about to you know really make some noise. And things didn't go that way. So they like that. That I had a catch against North Carolina and uh, it was a quick 12 yard jump. So that offseason, they're like, hey, you know, maybe we can use you as the Percy Harvin, kind of put you in the slot, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, we didn't have that type of offense yeah, yeah. To, to accommodate nothing. We was power. You know what I mean? Like, how are you going to have jet sweeps and, you know, options and the whole nine like a Percy Harvin? We yeah. don't even have that. Now we had a quarterback, Jamil, who I believe could have got that done, but sure. our offense wasn't our offense wasn't set up for that. So that experiment, you know, as they call it, didn't work. So that's how um, you know, Sad ended up getting hurt later that season against Middle Tennessee. Um, and then the other said, I mean, excuse me, the other pyramid, I don't know what was going on with him, but he was kind of fading <laughs> out. <laughs> so, you know, uh it was just Keith. He fade pretty much, and, and going into that Maryland, that's when they, that week before we played Maryland, they moved me back to running back. Because the game before that, against Middle Tennessee when Sega hurt, I didn't even step on the field. That's crazy. Were you going to running back meetings? That week, but before that, I was going to all the wide that, receivers. Yeah, using the wide receiver meetings. That's wild right there. So essentially, they basically was like, listen, 
if if we if we got these people that's that's healthy, they, we're gonna play them. You know what I'm saying? But once there's no other options, we're gonna need you to come back here and play this uh this 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 running back position. So and then you went off when it when hand went off. So what was you thinking going into your first like real game about like we about to like you it's your it's your ball, it's your game. Like what's up with that? Honestly, what you honestly um I remember sitting in the parking lot in Maryland talking to my best friend and from back home. And I'm like, yo, I think they screwed me again. You know what I mean? Because I felt like I was screwed so much leading up to that. Yeah. Uh, so honestly, like, I didn't watch film that week. I didn't do nothing. And I remember going back in, like, maybe an hour before we was leaving. And Coach Deck seen me in the hall. And he like, yo, I hope you're ready tonight. And so I, I'm a straight shooter with Dex. You know what I mean? That's the yeah. relationship that we had. So I said, man, listen, y'all ain't going to play me like, you gotta keep playing me, you know what I mean? Keep it real. He was yeah. like, nah, juice, like, like I'm serious, juice, like you in the game plan. So I straight went right to the little hall room where we had the film set up. Yeah. I have a man locked the computer and I started watching film, like all the blitzes, because that was my biggest thing, just knowing what blitzes blitz. they come as yeah. far as getting the ball, like that's natural. Like, I don't I don't need you to teach me how to do that. Yeah. But I just needed to be able to identify what was their favorite blitz. So I went and I started watching all the blitz packages. And you know, after that, oh, like, was this? Just, this, is, this was right before the game. Right before the game, less than an hour before we was taking off was the first time I took that game serious to even look at film. Like I said, during the meetings, yo, I wasn't paying attention. It was like I'm not playing. Like you know what I mean? Like, and I'm tired of y'all moving me here, moving me there, telling me I'm gonna play this role, I'm gonna fulfill this need, and yeah, I'm I'm cool on that. Oh, that's crazy, man. In my head, just like it's it's just amazing how that happened. Like it was a huge game, and it's obviously it changed the course of your career at the University of Virginia. Uh, and you'll probably be ever. I mean, that, that that game they talk about Chris Long stack, but in my mind, that was that was your game. In my mind, like yo, you you made all the big plays in that game. Uh, from my thought process, but essentially, like you know, did you feel like you was back at home when you was getting the rock? Like actually in the game, it felt like it was so slow. You always play slow. The game came easy to you. Did anybody apologize and be like, yo, man, we, we you know what I'm saying? Dex was like, man, I knew you so, could do this. Like, so, nah, happened? nah, nah, nah. So this is the, this is some crazy stuff. So after that season, you know, like nobody really said nothing after that. You know yeah. what I mean? It was, it was cool. But after that season, before I went home, Coach, uh, Coach Grow put me in his office. And it was basically telling me, you know, I need to improve my game, you know, in all these areas and that I wasn't fast and like all this. And like, like I left the meeting. Oh, like, after the Gator Bowl, he told you you wasn't fast? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I left the meeting, yo, and I'm like, wh- like, what just happened? So I go down to Coach Dex and I tell Coach Dex what, he, what, what was just said. He's like, yeah, man, I don't know. You know what I mean? So then we come out, you know, um, for that 08 season, right? You know, said that right now, nothing against said, but I think we all knew who was the most dangerous running back at that point, you know, mm-hmm. running, catching, however you want to break the game down. Right. So, you know, I'm working my butt off that spring, that summer camp. He had, Coach Girl actually praises me in the team room, you know, for practicing hard, which I never got because I'm doing every extra. So like to me, Chase, this is my money year. Yeah. Like, I'm just coming off this year. I just introduced myself to the world. Now it's like, okay, this is playtime. You know what I mean? Like I, I got the experience and, I, and I'm confident as ever at this point. So the game before USC, the, what, the week before USC, you know, he comes to me like, well, you know, we're going to have Seth start in the first two series is, you know, we'll rotate you in. So I'm like, damn, really? Yeah. Cool. So go back to the USC game, right? I didn't get into the game for the second quarter. Wow, I remember and that. Scored, and I scored a touchdown. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's the second quarter. You know what I mean? Like, because I was on, I was on a fire in that USC game. My whole head was spinning. <laughs> and was, I had no idea what was going on out there, boy. So yeah, I probably had no idea. Yeah, what man. But 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 yeah, man. That 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 like it played with my confidence. You know what I mean? Because now it's like, y'all prove to y'all that I can do this. Yeah. And now we playing USC, and I honestly can tell USC was was ready for me. Like their whole deep, what's up, five? Once I got to get, oh, what's up, five? Show me something, five. Oh, you hyped up, five. You, so they knew, you know what I mean? And, and honestly, if I'm a coach, if I know a dude out there that's legit running four, three, four, four speed, breaking away from everybody, you know, can catch the ball from wide to slot and can run inside the tackle, that's what I'm going game point for. Yeah. That was a physical run. You weren't going to run USC over. No. Nah. Like, come on, dog. They whole 11 was going first round. You know what I mean? 
so they were worried about the speed. That's how, you know, I mean, that was my game, you know, yeah. and I think I was the first person, when the only person to score in that USC defense for like the first seven weeks. Mm, I mean, that makes sense because they had Taylor Mays. I mean, everybody was – Ray Malagu. Yeah, Malagu, yeah. yeah, all them boys. Everett, uh, Everett Griffinson. Uh, yeah, they, they were, were like – They were loaded. They was uh, big. Brian Cushing. But, yeah, yeah, man, that, that's but that's crazy. The story is – I mean, I know the answer, but the story is that, they that um, you know, this is my first game going to uh, – it's like my first game dressing, walking the field, all those different type of things like that. Uh, I'm a red shirt freshman. And I'm thinking – I thought it was our tradition to walk around the field like this. I didn't know that we walked down the like sure, yeah. the middle of the field. So first, guess you can see we walk around the field because they over there in the middle of the field huddled yeah. up. I thought that was the way we did things around there. And then there, I come back to the hotel and everybody's like, "Yo, they just stormed our field or something like that." Like, what was going on? You know, so, you knew about that. Uh, what you thought so, about? That? So here's here's my take on USC. That whole approach, right? Now, Chase, I'm looking at this money game. Okay, y'all got 11 dudes solidified on our there. If I can crack 80 to 100 yards, or I, I, I'm good. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and my thing, too, was you give me the ball more, the team got a better chance to win. You know what I mean? That was honestly how, how I thought. But that night that we showed up and we did our pre-walk, and everybody was, like, kind of big eyes looking at them dudes and, like, amazement, I'm like, all right, that's, that's a big red sign. So, yeah. and, and people, if you go back to the actual game deck, just how hype I was, Chase. I was never really a talker until like you talk to me. Joe McKnight, Ray Matalu, Sean, all them dudes, there's about 10 of them in the middle of the field. Right before we did our little punt and we run in, oh, go look at the tape. I'm sitting out there, I'm jawing at all them dudes. Like, I'm like, well, this is my money day. Y'all don't understand. I, to go on. For, I wanted this moment. You know what I mean? And when I seen everybody running away and nobody coming to join in, I said, oh, yeah, we ain't ready today. We ain't ready today. <laughs> we ain't ready today. It's, gonna get, it's about to get ugly quick. Yeah, we weren't ready. No, nah, that was uh, that was my first taste of it. I, I, hey, listen, it was a different taste. I think that's the – that might be the biggest game or the, the weirdest atmosphere because, I the like, the, the pregame at – we used to stay at the Omni. The pre mm-hmm. like the pregame, like, meetings and stuff like that, dude, the elevator was just packed. I don't know if you remember that or nothing like that. The elevators was packed. I couldn't even get on the elevator. I think I actually was late to the meeting. <laughs> I think I was actually late to the meeting, bro. And uh, I'm like, yo, it, I just had a – like, this is a, all my first time experience. Everybody else – nobody else told me, like, it's not like this usually, bro. It was just crazy. No. It was wild. Yeah, I think, I, honestly, I think that's the highest um, capacity that we had that game. The numbers-wise, I remember I looking at it. Yeah, it was crazy. We couldn't even get down the elevator. That joint was wild. So so yeah, man. You uh you played out the season. Obviously, it's not you know you kind of you and said going back and forth, um in that situation, um you th- thunder and lightning. I guess y'all was y'all was trying to reenact thunder and lightning out here. And lightning uh, was on the sideline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, what what was like your so you know you've had your chance. You probably the biggest. You know the season wasn't going as expected. Uh, what did we do that year? What was it, like four or five wins, something like that. Yeah, it was terrible. It was a bad year. But you, I'm pretty sure you had, what was your thought process your last year at school? What were you thinking going in there and you sharing time? I mean, you already told us that, you know, you didn't want to be sharing time pretty much. Or you felt like you deserved it. Um, I'm pretty sure most people would say that. Uh, coming off of MVP of the Gator Bowl, uh, doing all that stuff that you did the previous year. Did you make an all-ACC yeah. team at all on that on that previous nah, year? No, because I only played six games. Only played six games? Yeah, and that's what I said. I had a thousand yards and ten touchdowns six games. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So then you come in here. So – NFL, what they say, man? What they what they talking about? I know you talked about it was hurt a little bit. Um, UVA never told you anything about that at all. No, no, nah, no, nah, not really. Um, yeah. So I remember uh, against Indiana when I had uh, got the double stinger and they carted me off. Mm-hmm. Um, my senior year, actually, uh, yeah, they carted me off, and uh, you know they did some tests and everything was cool. You know what I mean? They didn't say like, oh, this is like your career is over. Yeah. Obviously, because I finished the season, you know what I mean. So, like, I honestly didn't see this this coming, you know, at Cincinnati. And I'm gonna keep it truthful. Um, I remember walking into the locker room. Uh, they had Cedric Benson as their starting tailback there, and he was pretty much on his way out. And they had the backup. I forget his name at this point, but Chase. This how how locked in I was. I walked by the dude. He was sitting at his locker. I said, "Yo, your time's up here." Time's up. Like, I was like, because to me at that point. If 
I break the gates like how I did in college, there's no going back to the bench. Yeah, yeah. Not at that, not at that level. You know, it's too much money involved. You're not too going back. Or another, or another team can pick you up. You know what I mean? See your value. Hey, he, we're bringing him here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and sad actually, you know, was was on that team. They brought him in during that right before that time. So that was extra little personal. I'm like, now here's another chance for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, and like yeah. I said, it's it's competition. You know, we yeah, yeah. said good friends, nothing personal, but it's competition. For sure. Um, here's an here's another chance for me to show you. You know that I was better than you, and some things just fell. You know, in better favor for you. you yeah. Um, but yeah, like I was so locked in, man. And then I remember uh, sitting in the um, the team room, and you know the NFL physical that Jones like six seven hours. They literally you know, test the MRI and x-ray, everything, yeah. you know, possible. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, maybe um, I forgot to sign somewhere, you know, on, on the paperwork or, or something. He said, hey, the, uh, we need to bring you to the doctor, you know, and I'm like, it's a drug test? I'm like, I'm good or not. Like, I don't even drink alcohol for at that time. Like, I was lasered in. I'm like, yeah. whoa, what was going on? And then um, he handed me a disc and some paperwork. And was like, uh, you know, you got spinal stenosis and bone spurs. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but we can't keep you. You know, your career is pretty much over. Um, and this guy right here, um, you know, you grab your bag, he'll be taking you to the airport. Hmm. Like it happened that fast. I'm like, yeah. like what, what, what the heck just happened? Like yeah. my life just like I'm getting on a plane this morning, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm about to like really like chase something. And I'm more locked in than I've ever been in my life. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I took some moments for college and granted, you know what I mean? It was more of a, you know, fun experience. But to me, like the NFL, like that was that was going to be straight business. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it just ended that way. You know what I mean? Unexpectedly. And the same day? Same day. I got on the flight that morning. I arrived in Cincinnati at 12. And my flight back home was at 1030 that night. That's crazy. Well, I guess like, what was your experience with the draft? Like, did you ha- did you think you might have a chance to get drafted at all? Um, and no. kind of like, did you watch it? Did you or just you just waiting for no. somebody to call you at the thing? What was your experience? Nah, like? nah. So my um, I knew I wasn't getting drafted simply because you know I got injured that year. Missed, I think it was two games. Uh, I didn't get a lot of carries. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I only had three games where I had the ball over fifteen times. Mm-hmm. You know that season. So numbers wise, okay. Like and like I said, I wasn't. At that point, I wasn't worried about the numbers because I knew that I can play with this with these guys and at this level, you know, once I'm actually given a decent chance. You know what I mean? So that I, I wasn't worried about getting drafted, none of that. You know what I mean? I was just like, I need a chance. But uh, exactly when the draft ended, I was sitting in a parking lot in front of my mom's house and Cincinnati called, you know what I mean? Within two minutes of the draft, um, it was Tampa contacting my agent. And I think it might have been um, Jacksonville, I think it was, too. Um, you know, so they contacted and then I'm like, yo, I'm going with Cincinnati. You know what I mean? Because they got an old running back who was literally on his way out. Yeah. Um, they they had a good screen game, which played to to my role. Um, and then also the, the running back coach there, Coach Anderson, well, he was from my city. Oh, okay. You know, he, he's from Harrisburg. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I got somebody there, you know, going to be my position coach. That can, you know, hey, get him some extra reps and just just give me a chance to prove myself. I don't want nothing, you know, yeah, give yeah. it to me, of course, but I just need that door. And I'm a, I'm, I was going to kick that thing open. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I told you, I seen the back. I'm like, yo, the time's done here, buddy. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, I said, his time's done here. It wasn't even here the next day. <laughs> it was that guy that was running his mouth. Right, right. <laughs> right, that's right. Funny. Nah, that's right. Funny, man. Yeah. Um. That's, that's crazy. But essentially, like, what was, let's get back to, like, the University of Virginia. So your time at University of Virginia, you know, there's things I talked about with people. And I'm like, since my time being there, there's a couple people that I've seen it, seen use, like, the network of University of Virginia pretty well while they're there. And then there's, like, everybody else is, like, stuck in the football bubble. You know what I'm saying? You're only hanging out with football people type situation. How do you feel like your experience was with getting to know people outside of University of Virginia, outside of the football team, especially when your name was kind of big? Um, he was on the he was on the front of the poster. They selling your jerseys. Like everybody got the five on. Like, did you do you think you used your spotlight well enough to really gain the like meet the people at the University of Virginia network that could benefit you uh, down the road type situation? Nah, nah. Um, and, and it was hard to be honest. You know the 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 schedule 
it doesn't really allow us, you know, a lot of free time to interact with, you know, the, the student student body per se. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our, our classes and meetings, are, our meetings, you know, practice was 2.15, you know what I mean? So like when people get out of class, that, that three, four o'clock range where they're linking up, you know, and kind of networking, you know, and having these conversations, yeah. we're at practice. Then we, you know, we're eating meals together. So you're always, you know, study hall till 1030. So you're always around, you know, that same core of guys that you that you kind of play with, you know what I mean? So you don't really get, you know, you'll have sometimes in, in the calf, you know, the basketball team, you know what I mean, lacrosse or other sports, but it was, it was, it was tough to engage with them. Um, and also, I feel like they didn't really want to engage with me. Like I'm gonna keep it real. Um, you know, if we're we're talking about our experiences individual, I didn't really have any white friends. You know, like um, when we talk about girls, like no white girls had interest in me. You know what I mean? Like I remember, um, you know, Denzel, you know, that's my roommate, you know, and I would tell some people, I'm like, yo, like people will not speak to me on this campus. You know what I mean? So we would go to grounds and, and, and uh, right by the bus stop, right by the cafeteria, you know, and I would just sit there, you know, people would walk by, and I'd just wave, hey, how you doing? They'll just give me that look. And it was like, okay. That's like, crazy. like nobody, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, man. It was, it was, it was weird. Different. It was my, you know. Was it a culture shock when you got there from like as a, as a freshman and stuff like that? Was like go, coming to the University of Virginia and being in this environment where you know it's a different so, environment than most people. Like, what do you what do you? So feel like? I think I think it was the greatest thing that happened to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that because I come from you know uh, a city who thrives on materials. So our, our our hierarchy is not you know education and realistic things. It's you know, how many Jordans do you got? You know what I mean? Like, do you got the, the most expensive belt? Do you got the latest, you know, apparel? That type of thing. So, like, when I got to Virginia, I had easily 20, 30 pair of Jordans. You know, I had a big Jesus paint, uh, ear, I mean, a necklace, the earrings, the gold uh, watch. I had it all, you know, dressing up every day for school. So that first semester, you know, I'm looking around. I'm just like, I don't fit in here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't like these people don't even get dressed. Like at my high school, dog, like we dress every single day. If you don't come top notch, like you know what I mean? Like people slaying you. You know what I mean? Like you got some problems, especially you know being that top athlete. Like you know what I mean? Like you was that guy. Um, so that was completely different. And when I say it was the best thing that happened to it, because it made me learn that materials hold no value mm-hmm. at all. You know, I was meeting you know people on the team who, you know, was teaching me about credit and stuff like that, that just wasn't, you know, exposed to me, you know, in, in my community at all. You know, I, I didn't know anybody, you know what I mean, besides my my, my dad who owned their house, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, like, now I'm learning a lot of these people on my team and just some of the, the students that I did meet, their parents own this, you know, they own that, you know, they, they invest their money into stocks and, you know, they got different funds set up, you know, for their kid, you know what I mean? So I'm looking like... Yeah, I'm looking like I got some money. I'm acting like I got some money, but I'm lost and I'm behind. I'm behind, you know, and it's like if they wanted to go buy some Jordans, yes, they could do that. But, you know, it's not going to help them. So now I'm going to be real. If the sneakers are over like 75, I I don't even think about buying. You know what I mean? Like it's pointless at all. And then, you know, I've really started to, uh, you know, become a fan of Steve Jobs during that time as well. And when you look at Steve, Ray wore a black turtleneck every single interview meeting, you know what I mean? And some some look like some Wrangler blue jeans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you so know what I mean? <laughs> but but you know, this guy is, you know, he's trend setting in a in a in a legit way. Like this dude is a billionaire, you yeah. know, and his company literally has changed the way society is today. Yeah. And it's going to be forever, you know, imprinting. You know, a lot of people don't even know who he is. Don't even know he started Apple. Don't even know he's the founder of Pixar. You know, all this animated stuff we watch, like, they don't even know that. That's but, right. Yeah, so that was, a, that was a good experience for me as far as learning the values of, of, of what really meant something in life. And it makes sense because, you know, we was definitely, you know, Jordans is definitely the front of the, everybody's attention right out the gate, especially when we got down there. Um I know you definitely had the chain. The chain was long too. You know what I'm saying? With no, with no small chain. <laughs> uh, but no, so you studied, uh, what'd you study? Anthropology, right? Yep, yep, yep. 
Do you feel like, you know, when you get recruited to the University of Virginia, everybody's like, you know, I mean, you might get to go to business school, you might get to do this, you might get to do that, all those different type of things. Do you feel like, uh, do you feel like, talk to us about the education side of things. Was it tough? Was it hard? Um, do you feel like it's a situation where you can only do a couple things um, and then it kind of hindered your ability to meet people again, you know what I'm saying? Like another thing that could have hindered your ability to meet different people is being in that same box as a lot of people got to go. A lot of us had to go to similar, um, you know, degrees, you know what I'm saying? So that almost like our class is almost half of us type situation. So um, talk to us about that experience just from, you know, I would say, obviously the recruit, you said it, academics is a big part of it. And then you leave and you get the anthropology major and the things of that nature. How do you feel like that affects yourself? Do you feel like it's good, bad? You know, you think it's a little bit hyped up as far as like, you know, everybody want to go like, if I'm there at University of Virginia, I might as well get a business degree or something like that. I might as well get this degree. Like, so talk to us about let, me, let me let me let me ask you this, Chase. Yeah. Um, what did you major in? Sociology. Okay. So when it came down to the basics, we don't have a choice. Exactly. And that's one thing a lot of people do not understand. You know, it's it's oh, you're you're a sport, you athlete. You know, you're complaining. Um, you, you know, you get a free education. Yeah, I get that free education. But is that something that I have a real interest in? Is that something that I plan to use, you know, once this football career is over? Mm-hmm. Like, no. The reason, you know, we, we choose Anthro and Soch was because that's what our schedule allowed. So if you wanted to go into business or, you know, anything else, medical, whatever, you don't even you don't even approach the coaches to even say, yo, hey, I want to kind of take this. Because you know you're going to get shot down because if you have to miss any meetings, you know, any lifts, even treatments, like you would literally get punished for missing a treatment. It's like, yo, like it's serious. So like, you know, football. Yeah, we say, OK, we're student athlete. It's athlete student. Um, and I think it's 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 a disadvantage for us because, one, we already have to, to carry the school of football. Like football is a school where the people know, it. you know, like we're studying these plays and we're having to make, you know, these quick decisions, you know, in an in, in instance of a second. And we're preparing and training our body to do that, you know, through all the winter workouts, the summer workouts, the film study, you know, so like we're, that's a whole nother major, which we should get credit for if we want to be technical. So when you look at it, we, we had that 8.30 to 10.30 window to kind of study, right? Study hall. And that was literally the only times you had to study unless you were going to stay up to, you know, hours of the night, but then turn around, have to be up seven in the morning, eight in the morning to run the same day back that is football driven. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, yes, these other students, they had, a, they had a chance to network, they had a chance to explore, they had a chance to um, actually invest in the class that, you know, say for say, hey, you know, I got to see right now, I actually need to put more time into this class. We're well with us. If we got that C, we don't have time to invest another two, three hours into this class to pour that C up to match a B or A that we have in all these other classes. So we kind of got to give all our classes the same amount of time. You know what I mean? Like, and it it just sucks because we just get that that label. Oh, well, you guys should be lucky. You know what I mean? You get a free education. No, like this comes with a price for real. It really does. And, and, and. You know, we don't get money out of this. Like you just said, I, I had, you know, balance of jersey, so cover of, you know, the magazines, billboard, whatever you name. You know how many times my cell phone got cut off in college? How many? Like at least 20. Like That's seriously. Cool. You know what I mean? Because I can't pay these bills on time. You know what I mean? And, and you know, my parents, you know, they aren't the best, you know what I mean, as far as financially stable. So mm-hmm. it wasn't like I could call back home and, hey, mom, like my mom's struggling to pay her own bills. You know what I mean? My dad, you know, got a mortgage. You know what I mean? Like they got their own responsibilities. And a lot of times these players, you know, just across the nation, they come from inner cities. So we struggle, you know what I mean, being able to to just take care of the basic needs. And they yeah. think, oh, well, you're on scholarship. Everything's taken care of. It's not. We got other things, you know, that we we we, we need, you know, yeah. like that cell phone, like you know, you want us to come to the McHugh every single day, but you want to charge us a parking pass. And then we got to pay, you know, gas to put in our car to get us there. Like, where is this money coming from if we can't get, you know, at least $200 check a month to go do what we want? Yeah. Like, we can't work like a normal student. So I just think the lifestyles and experiences, you know, it's just completely different from, you know, an athlete to a student from everything down to your education selection to the time you can invest in your education to the networking aspect. And then sometimes, you know, um, we're viewed as as those jocks or, you know, people who are put on high pedestals, you know, or think that we're better than, you know, the average student. So we got that uh, 
that that label on us, so they don't even want to approach us. You know what I mean? Because they feel as though we're gonna blow them off. But you know, in reality, man, we just like you. We college students struggling, you know, trying to find common ground, have some fun. But because yeah. you see me on TV, it's like, well, he may think he's this way, so I'm not even going to deal with him. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's 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 cool. Because um, you know, I, I was going to ask you a question. Do you think athletes should get paid? And I guess you just told me that uh, for sure. And you know, you would if if athletes were getting paid the way they're talking about paying people, using their likeness and things of that nature, like. Going into your senior year, they was using everything. After the Texas Tech, after that Texas Tech round, boy, they was using all your likeness for everything, for sure. I'm, so I, I'm still waiting on Nike to cut that check. Need to cut that. Oh, um, nah, but but seriously, I think you know, n- you know, no more than three, four hundred dollars a month, you know, should be ideal to get a player. You know what I mean? Comfortable where I can go grocery shop. You know what I mean? Because the they say, oh, well, you get these meals, but we get tired of them doing seven days a week, four times a day. Yeah, like, can I go doze off somewhere else? You know what I mean? Yeah, so, no, I'm not for them to get crazy money, you know what I mean? But they they deserve, we deserve something. Something for sure. Uh, so this is my, I mean, we're kind of, I'm going to start rounding it up a little bit, but uh, wrapping it up a little bit, but essentially this is a huge, a big, a big thought process, a big question. So I say that the NFL and the NCAA don't do enough for the kids that are in the middle of, yo, I'm good enough to play in the NFL. Um, and I'm trying to, like, I'm good enough to play in the NFL, so I need to train. I need to get ready for the NFL. And I'm like, you know, I'm making sure that I'm doing everything in college to get ready for the NFL. Uh, but essentially, like, it's not 100% that I'm going to make my NFL might not get a check type situation. So I think that the NCAA or the NFL needs to do something to help kids transition into whatever they want to do next. Um Somehow, something. There's nothing in place for that. You know, after NCAA, after you're done with UVA, they're done with you. You know what I'm saying? After you get done with the NFL, they're done with you. Um, especially for if you haven't been there for years, somebody like you who's just in there for, for a day or so. Um, you know, yes, has anybody called you and be like, yo, you good? You good? Like, did anybody reach out to you in any form or fashion um, during the time when you said you was in a dark space and be like, yo, this is a program or this is something we can do to help you trying to get to the next best space? Or did you have to figure everything out on your own? of how to get out of your dark space and move on to the next day in life. Now, I'm going to be honest. Uh, nobody from UVA followed up, checked in. You know what I mean? Like, it was once I was done, you know, it was, all right, you know what I mean? We on to the next, you know, running back or the next player, you know what I mean, that we're invested in. Like, yeah. no coaches called me, you know, no academic coordinators called me, um, nobody. You know what I mean? And I don't even think, you know, they even researched the situation and even see, you know, how things played out with me. Okay, did Michael, did he sign anywhere? Did he just stop playing? You know, what was the outcome? No, I even called, you yeah. know, to follow up. But I will say currently, um, I've been in contact with Coach Grow. Good. Like, he, he's he's actually, you know, been reaching out, which, you know, we had a good conversation uh, back in the summer about this, you know, situation, you know, and he was like, you know, I'm sorry, you know, for not playing you, you know, during those times. I, I really, you know, kind of dropped the ball on that. And that's all I wanted to hear as a man, you know what I mean? Like, even though it's, you know, 10 years later, it's like, oh, okay, you can say that, you know, you made a mistake, cool. You know, ain't nothing we can do, go back and change that. But, you know, he's actually donated to my organization, um, you know, financially. So, you know, uh, he's been one that's kind of been, you know, reaching out. Um, Craig Littlepage, uh, he actually reached out to a guy that I know in my city, older gentleman who's a UVA alumni. Uh, he's mm-hmm. actually... Uh, president of MLK leadership here. And he just said, you know, I see Michael is doing good things in his community. So, you know, it, it's good, you know, to see that and hear that from, you know, those people who we, you know, we kind of work with for day to day basis. No, that makes sense, man. Um, so tell us, how did you kind of like, you know, you said you was, you've been dropping some hints, you've been drinking, you were smoking down there in Miami and stuff like that. Once you got cut from the, uh, or they released you from Cincinnati. Yeah. So tell us like, uh, this is a, this is, this is like in between Capital Rebirth starting and your daughter uh, was your, your daughter wasn't born yet, right? No, she was born within that first year of me, you know, getting that news. OK, so within the first year. Um, so she settled then, me down. She settled me down. Settled, me, settled you down. So in between this space, you're trying to figure out your identity again of who you are as a person, as a man. Um, how did you get through that space? I know you said your daughter was a big part of it, but just just go ahead and give us some ideas as far as like. If somebody's in a down place, not really sure what they think and what they're doing, uh, how to get through it, how to push through it, and come to some of the things you leaned on. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, that was the craziest moments of my life. Uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure you went through a chase. You know, once you were done playing, your phone stopped ringing. You know what I mean? Like, people yeah. ain't really, 
ain't really around no more, you know. Um, so all that to say was it made me realize that one, whatever I'm going through, I got to get through on my own. You know, and, and that's with anything in life. You know what I mean? You're going to have people who support you, some people, you know, not supportive. But if you believe in yourself, then, you know what I mean, you'll pull through. And what I did was, is that, like I told you, I went back and looked at my my, my natural passion. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I look back as, as a teenager, my thing was working every summer with, you know, Parks and Rec. Mm-hmm. And when I was in college, I would volunteer, you know, at some of the elementary schools there, just helping some of the teachers you know, that didn't feel like work. And I had nine nieces and nephews, you know, well, some came later, but I had nieces and nephews, um, you know, and I would write their initials, you know, under my eye before every college game, you know what I mean? So I'm like, kids, you know, and I'm like, well, if I had my own, I guarantee that's something that can change me, you know what I mean? And give me new hope. And like, I took a leap of faith. We weren't married, you know, it wasn't ideal. You know, but I just felt like at that time, you know, all science was pointing to a kid. Now this, you know, like I said, this is the way that I chose to take, you know, and the mindset that I had at that time made me make that decision. And and I got to tell my daughter all the time, like, you legit saved me because I don't know had I been able to have a child, you know, during that time, had I still been drinking, had I still been partying, you know, and this was a Monday through Sunday type of ordeal. This was a like, you, Miami? you know, that's Miami. Oh man, Chase, you know the Miami life. <laughs> you know, it is it is literally uh party season 24-7 in Miami. You know, like you can find something to do at 6 a.m., 6 p.m. Yeah. Um, the beach is always, you know, a live area to go. Uh so yeah, that was just you was know. B, my was B down there too? Is that why we yeah. down there? Yeah. Okay, cool. So you was living yep. good. And, yeah. And, and, yeah, and then I didn't want to be home. Yeah. You know, because I honestly, uh, I felt like I let my city down. Like I played football, um, you know, because I loved it, of course. But ultimately, my goal was to, you know, use that vehicle to kind of help my city. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll get back into that. Like I said, I had my daughter. And when she was born, that straightened me up. Like I stopped drinking. Like I honestly may drink, you know, some wine here and there, you know, and that's only started like two years ago. And it's funny. So now, you know, when I do drink a cup of wine, um, you know, at night, whenever, you know, I see my daughter, uh, she sees the bio. She's like, Dad, you changed. Dad, what you drink, What you doing this for, Dad? Like, Dad, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, so she's holding me accountable. But now I, I just can't get into it. I can't party no more. I can't yeah, yeah. do any of that because, you know, I, I live for her. And then when I say that, you know, like I said, my whole organization was built to create a better environment for her to be able to pass down, you know, a, a legacy as far as my organization to her. You know, and like I said, I could have chose, you know, to name my foundation, you know, Michael Simpson. That's something you can Google, something easily recognizable, you know. But with this whole new identity, I didn't want to use, you know, that football platform. Like, I don't even really bring up football to people unless they find out about, oh, okay, that's the guy that played football. You know, like, I don't want that to to be like the um, the driving force to make people like, oh, I support him or not. No, like support this because this is something that's great. This is something that's going to change the community and everyone can benefit. So, you know, like I said, anybody going through something, find out what your true passion is. You know what I mean? Look back into what really, you know, you enjoyed before you became that, that adult. You know what I mean? Because sometimes we get caught up and, you know, just trying to, okay, this salary looks good in this profession. Let's go after this profession. But is that true happiness? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, and I tell, you know, my team and myself all the time, we take the Steve Job approach. We don't focus on the money at all. You know, we focus on the consumers, um, you know, which is our residents, you know, and, and if you continue to do enough good, money's naturally going to find you. Like I said, this project that I put out there, you know, it, it's going to need, you know, $60 million. We feel very confident that that money is going to be there simply because, you know, the passion, you know, yeah. people believe in it. You know what I mean? So. Whatever it is, you know, find a way to, to get back into whatever it was, you know, that you actually enjoy. And trust me, you know, you can start a nonprofit. It's very simple. You can get an LLC. You know, it's very simple. Pour your passion into to whatever that you believe in, you know, and kind of work for yourself. And know that's not for everybody. But, you know, if you're going through a deep press, a deep situation, you know, work for yourself in that situation, kind of. You know what I mean? Because you continue to go to work as I did during that time. But I was just going through emotions. Like I said, what brought me out is focusing on something that I really loved. 
did it was it um you know for, for me personally like starting my own business gave me like another NFL to chase if that makes sense so it was something that I could pick up wake up every day and and, and have some type of control in what I did to get towards mm-hmm. that type of situation so now what you what you're talking about is is um gyms for sure um I don't think I'm missing anything man am I missing anything before we before we uh, start wrapping this up any other stories we can't be told on air <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, me and Juice was neighbors. Me and Juice was neighbors out there. What was the name of our Barracks West? Yeah, Barracks West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I yeah, forgot yeah. you live way out there. Yeah, right. way out there. Yeah, you, you was on there. your own out there, too. Hey, low key, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was kind of mad y'all boys showed up out there. <laughs> Listen, that was the only place that could do that six months. Because remember, we was out. Oh, yeah, y'all was out, right? Yeah, yeah y'all was out. And yeah, then we was just out. Me out there. I don't think nobody else came out yeah. with y'all. Yeah, it was just it. That was it. Not that was like low key spot, like oh yeah, we was really with the town. Yeah. We with the townies, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but no, nah, man, that's good, man. It's good catching up with you, man. Hey, I look up to you. I know everybody else is looking up to you. What you're doing, man, is is super inspiring. Um, and for me personally, it shows like you know, throw a big target out there and go get it. You know what I'm saying? That type of situation, and don't just be settling for small things uh, in life in general. Uh, Keep, keep trying to make change, do it for the right reasons. And like you said, man, things is going to happen. So, hey, man, however we can support, however I can support, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to tap in and make sure that we can get it done. Um, yeah. And obviously yeah. using this platform, we try to get as many UVA people on here. Yeah, yeah, man, let's make this a UVA chain. Like I said, this is something that, that you know, is, is an issue across the nation that we're trying to solve. This ain't just the, you know, Harrisburg, Harris Spain man. type of thing. So, you know, we definitely are looking to expand. You know, of course, this is going to be the home base because this is where I'm from. But, yeah, man, I would love to, you know, connect with different Wahoos across, you know, United States. And, hey, you in Washington, you in Chicago, you know, you in Florida. Hey, let's all – like I said, I'm, I'm more of like I want to be that quarterback. Now I want yeah. to help everybody. Like, you're doing you know? it. You're doing it. So if I try to do it here, I know who to go to and who to talk to <laughs> about how to go down to this situation. So, hey, that's Thank respect you, right there. Let everybody know where they can reach you at, man, where they can find you at, where they can keep up to date with everything that you're working on and doing. Yeah. Um, Facebook, Michael Juice Simpson, Instagram, uh, Michael919, I believe. Uh, Instagram, Bat one, Batman um, underscore 919. Um, you know, our social handles for our organization is uh, Capital Rebirth on Facebook, uh, Capital Rebirth 717 on um, Instagram, and I believe the same thing is for our Twitter handle. Um, our website is www.capitalrebirth.org. Well, that wraps us up, man. Another good one, UVA legend in the building, record holder. I don't know if we had too many record holders on the podcast so far, man. I don't know. And I don't think it's going to be broke no time soon, just so everybody knows. No, 90, so. 96 yards in a bowl game, long, longest, run, longest uh, rush from scrimmage in a bowl game history. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that's hopefully, going nowhere. Yeah, hopefully one day I got a son, he can break it. That's it. <laughs> hey, I know there's one thing in defense, like in defense as a corner, I never wanted to give up 90 some yards or any <laughs> 90 some <laughs> yards, boy. Hey, that, I, I, re, I rewatched that play recently. I don't know where it came up at. I rewatched that play, and bro, them corners 15. He, he, I don't know if you see that. That was 15 to play corner for them. Uh, hey, bro, he looked bad at that. <laughs> He looked bad, boy. Boy, nobody gonna catch me. Like I was, I was honestly running at like seventy five. I was looking at the monitor. The yeah, whole yeah, time. he was looking at the monitor. Yeah, but so no, fifteen. Leave. You might ruin any any chance he got to play in the league. <laughs> any chance he got to play in the league, it's over. He can't. He let that go because it was his crackback that he was supposed to replace on. Mm-hmm. And then you ran he right back, ran in. right by him. Yeah, and then it was over, and then he couldn't catch him. So. Yeah, two left yeah. feet on that. Thank so you. I know his, his NCAA Matt, his NCAA uh, ratings had to be bad after that. <laughs> It's over. But no, nah, man, appreciate yeah, man. you jumping on here, man. We'll holler, man. We appreciate you. We'll holler at your boys next week. We out. Oh, yeah.